Welcome to Opalesk TV. I am in Singapore together with Peter Douglas. Peter is the founder of GFIA and has been researching Asian hedge funds since 98 and investing in Asian hedge funds since the late 2000s. So he's one of the true veterans in the Asian hedge fund industry and in the Asian hedge fund space and has seen many ups and downs and many cycles. Now, Peter, my question to you is, when Asian hedge funds fail or when they fold up, for what reasons? What do they do wrong? My first comment is that the Asian hedge fund industry has been surprisingly resilient. We've seen surprisingly few real failures. You know, clearly, there's, yeah, there's, there's attrition. Roughly 10% of the universe a year will turn over. Which is in line with the global hedge funds? Which is in line with global hedge fund norms. So despite the volatility of the Asian capital markets and the macroeconomic picture in Asia, you know, the Asian hedge fund industry has done a pretty good job of, of staying safe. Where we have seen managers create problems for themselves, and therefore the kind of red flags that we look for, the top of the list would be size. Asia is not friendly to large pots of capital. So if we see a, an alpha-seeking strategy that's a billion dollars or more than a billion dollars, yet we know that manager is sailing into a headwind. You know, we know that manager is making their own life difficult. Doesn't mean to say they can't do it, I and mean, there's some very clever people out there, there's some great managers that do manage large amounts of capital, but it's much harder. What is the sweet spot then? So it, it depends on the strategy. Yeah, if you want a point estimate, probably about 500 million, but that's 500 million plus or minus 200 million. And it really does depend on, on the strategy. It also depends on where in the market cycle we are. You know, at the top of the Asian market cycle, you know, apparent capacities can be much higher. You know, at the bottom of the cycle, apparent capacities can be much lower. And that... that Apparent qualification is quite important because, yeah, and this is an obvious comment, but you're managing a hedge fund to, to mitigate two main buckets of risk. You know, first of all, you've got your ongoing day-to-day -day portfolio risk, if you like, and then you've got your tail risk of managing your portfolio for the very bad, uncommon event. One of the fundamental characteristics of most Asian capital markets, most emerging markets generally, is liquidity is always provisional. Developed market, you've typically got a bedrock of long-term institutions who are always there in the market. In Asia, with the exception of Japan and Australia, you don't have that. Asian markets are generally driven by, by retail investors, by foreign investors, or by local institutions with much more flexible mandates than you would see elsewhere in the world. The net result is that every now and again, whether that's every three years or five years or seven years, investors take the liquidity ball and go home. And you need to be managing your portfolio with that liquidity implosion in mind, not with your day-to-day -day apparent market liquidity. So a strategy which you know, snapshot right now looks like it can take a billion dollars quite comfortably. You know, if you really stress that, probably can't. So that's a long answer, but my, but the main investment issue to focus on really is appropriate size. From the perspective of the hedge fund investor, how can a hedge fund investor really monitor this appropriately and not fall into any pits? Well, I suppose the. Uh, the commercial answer is they can pay me. What we would do is continue a dialogue with the manager, continue watching the assets, continue watching the rate of change of assets because that may not affect the, the liquidity of the investment portfolio directly, but it does affect the, the stresses within the organisation. The other sort of main sources of of failures and closures, it's nearly always organizational. Comes down, this is again, it's a big cliche of the hedge fund industry, it all comes down to the people. So as a hedge fund investor, certainly in Asia, 
you need to be fairly clear about the motivations and the reputations of the principles of the business. Now, are they there because their structure allows them to manage money better than they could elsewhere? Or are they there because on a three-year period, this might make them more money than they could make in an investment bank? You need to be very clear about what people are doing. And over the years, I would say that the majority of so voluntary closures, if you like, where managers have decided to wind down. I, I don't have a hard number, but intuitively, 60%, 70%, it's just been because it's not been working as well as a business as initially they'd expected. So not that the business was a complete failure, but the principals had expected that this was going to make them a great deal of money quite quickly, and it didn't. So we spend a lot of time trying to understand the business motivation and again from an investor's point of view you know if you see a, a a launch pitch book and in that launch pitch book it's discussing the fact that they have three years working capital and that this is a three-year project that that's an absolute red flag you know, you want people to be managing money because they are investment geeks and they couldn't manage money the way they wanted to in their investment bank that frustrated them that's why they're managing money that's a great reason we like that the investment bank was scaling back its proprietary activities and they weren't making the bonus that they were before so they'd, they'll have a go running a hedge fund. That's a terrible reason and has a high degree of failure on a two to four year view. Peter, what is the promise of the Asian hedge funds and do they really deliver? The promise of Asian hedge funds is, it, is that they give you a, a risk mitigated approach to Asian capital markets. So the first premise is, you know, do you want to be invested in Asian capital markets? Yeah, that's largely a macroeconomic story, which is a familiar one. It's also partly that it's a very rich source of alpha. You know, MSCI Asia has 14 underlying markets. Across the region, you've got 20,000 or so listed equities. And you know, the drivers of each of those securities are hugely different, as are the regulatory and operational constraints around them. So at a very simplistic level, you could argue that everything's mispriced. And it, it's a very interesting opportunity set for skilled investment professionals. You've got generally fairly good liquidity. In most markets, you have predictable regulation. So. You're in Asia partly because you want that Asian growth story, structurally it's important to the world, and partly because you want liquid and inefficient capital markets that provide alpha. What the Asian hedge fund industry does is really give you the choice of where on that sort of risk return, alpha, beta, liquid, illiquid spectrum you want to be. With a fair high degree of customization, and if you really want to be purely exposed to Asian uh, to Asian beta you can do that if you want purely market neutral you can do that if you want ATM like liquidity you can find it <clears throat> if you want to make money from from the illiquidity of some of the Asian assets you can do that so yeah w with 1200 1300 Asian hedge funds it's a very broad spectrum and allows investors really to slice and dice the Asian opportunity set with some accuracy. Peter, we talked about what is going wrong or what can go wrong on the side of the Asian hedge funds. Now, having researched this field since 98, you have probably seen also a lot of investors doing mistakes and errors and doing things wrong when investing in Asia. So what are the pitfalls for investors to invest in Asia and how can these be mitigated? Well, related to my first point, about capacity, investors from outside the region, you know, clearly it's difficult to familiarize yourself with a part of the world which culturally is different, is a 13 hour or 24 hour flight is in the wrong time zone. And there's a, there's a strong tendency to invest with the big guys because they create comfort. And investors just need to be aware that that comfort is expensive in terms of 
performance and risk. I think the second, especially at the moment, the the second and a substantial mistake that we see people make is fetish for ATM-like liquidity. Yeah, the the absolute and relative liquidity of a trade is an essential part of its risk return. And by excluding strategies which do anything apart from very liquid trades, investors are, are uh, severely constraining their opportunity set and actually increasing their risk because it forces managers into a smaller and smaller and more and more crowded pool. So right now, apart from apart from investors focusing far too much on large managers, which increases their risk, we also see that they're they're focusing too much on very liquid managers. Conversely, that creates an opportunity for investors to be prepared to go to the less liquid space because obviously with capital pouring into the very liquid bits of the opportunity matrix, you know, that opens up the arbitrages for people who can take illiquidity. And I think, and this is not a mistake by investors, but it's, it's almost an, an inevitability of allocators' finite bandwidth. Yeah, the appropriate way we feel to access the Asian opportunity set is with a a small portfolio of very good, appropriately sized managers. Yeah, we see, understandably but sadly, a lot of investors coming in wanting to write one ticket to get Asia done. You know, I've allocated my whatever it is, 50 million, 150 million to this manager that I'm familiar with. Therefore, the Asian hedge fund slice of my pie chart is now filled and I can move on to the next job. That not only constrains your opportunity set, it almost certainly leads you into a manager that's too big and you increase your operational risk because you only have one, you know, one set of idiosyncratic organisational risk in there. Again, an obvious comment for hedge fund investors, part of your portfolio approach is not just diversifying your investment risk, it's obviously diversifying the organisation risks that are natural to the idiosyncratic nature of a hedge fund business. We are now in April 2011. What's your outlook for the rest of the year and beyond that? You know, a statistician would say that your best guess about tomorrow's weather is what today's weather was and you know what we have seen recently and over the last couple of years in Asia is genuinely a huge amount of interest you know we've seen far more interest in Asian alternatives over the last two years from larger investing organizations from more senior people asking more appropriate questions than I've seen in the last 12, 13 years that I've been doing this. Conversely, we've seen very, very little execution. The only money that's been flowing has either been to the, you know, the asset gathering alternative managers, who I'm not sure we really consider as hedge funds, or at a much lower level to some of the uh, long only unconstrained managers, which yeah, perhaps we might talk about. And that continues to feel to be the case. However, we are getting some indications that some of the better boutiques are now beginning to see some small incremental allocations coming through. A lot of the conversations that we've been having with larger allocators, in particular in the US, to a certain extent in Europe as well, do seem to be moving closer towards execution. So my outlook is, is sort of weighted between, I think, we are still going to see an environment of a great deal of interest but hesitant allocation. At the margin, however, I do think that from a low base the rate of allocation is beginning to pick up and we will see more money coming into Asian alternatives through this year. What do you see is the opportunity set right now for investors who want to have exposure to Asia? Very broad. and I suspect for allocators that uh, yeah, have glanced at the Asian hedge fund industry over the last 10-12 years, they would be surprised at the breadth of strategies out there. 
Yeah, when we started, 85% plus of the industry was Jones Model, Fundamental Equity, Long Short. You know, now 55% of the universe might be equity long short, and that is itself sliced into a far greater range along the sort of alpha, beta, high gross, low gross, high net, low net spectrum. We're seeing more fixed income strategies. We're clearly seeing some of the multi-strats coming out of the, the uh, prop desks. So you've pretty much got the the breadth of strategy approaches to Asian capital markets that you would have in the US, US capital markets or in London for European capital markets. So it's very broad. And yeah, there's no doubt we feel that structurally most investment committees around the globe are moving to a position where Asia is now core rather than a tactical allocation at some point in the cycle, so people will be investing it. One of the subset which we haven't really touched, touched on, which is quite interesting, we're seeing a, a mini renaissance in unconstrained long manager. And again, when I started back in 98, the Asian boutique industry was all about unconstrained long managers and there were a few sort of maverick hedges at the margin. And then the hedge fund industry uh, took over. <clears throat> but we're beginning to see, you know, from a low base, a small resurgence in long-only absolute return investing. And that's matched by interest from investors. And I think one, one subset of investor appetite is, is really looking for, for intelligent beta. And people are saying, look, you know, we understand the volatility is going to be there. We want the growth. We might as well just go long. However, we understand that 20,000 listed equities, sell side coverage of 2,000. There's got to be a lot of inefficiencies. ETFs make no sense whatsoever. We need to be investing with the, the good fundamental stock pickers. And that's, that's beginning to come back. It's quite interesting. It's almost like the wheel is sort of going full circle. Peter, how do you see is this relationship between unconstrained long only and hedge funds? How, what's their different place in a portfolio and what's the trend that you see? As a firm, we don't really differentiate between hedge funds and unconstrained long. We, we define our universe as anybody who's trying to find alpha in public markets. So we actually see that there is no real difference. Both are trying to extract inefficiencies from equity pricing. Now clearly a high gross, very low net quasi-market neutral long short equity fund is trying to achieve a different result. But you know the whatever it is, quarter, third of the long short equity universe in Asia, it's really trying to find stock pricing inefficiencies. The only difference is structurally obviously you've got a short book on one, you don't on another. In terms of the way investors might want to look at these, I think a lot of it comes down to the, the volatility and the return profile that you want and what you're prepared to pay for it. You know, the, the classic good Asian equity long short guys that we see out there, in very, very simple terms, are trying to give you two thirds of the upside and one third of the downside. And for some investors, that's hugely helpful. You know, if you do have a, if you are very sensitive to your monthly mark to market, if you're sensitive to your month, your, your your annual volatility, that's very helpful. If you are insensitive to volatility, you genuinely don't have to mark your portfolio that often, and you are genuinely sold on the bull case for a Asian equities, then you can buy that more volatile beta story with more alpha embedded at the margin than you will find in most other universes for one and ten not two and twenty so as always yeah it's kind of what do you want and what would you like to pay for it